Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Leewood United Methodist Church. I am not Pastor Howard Johnson. My name is Julie Schropp. I'm a lay speaker for the Kansas City District, and I am overseeing worship today. And as part of that, I'd like to direct you to the big screens for some announcements. We have some exciting events coming up. We have a potluck that will be honoring our pastor, Howard Johnson. It is next Sunday, June 19th at Meadowbrook Park, and all of the information that you may need is online. We also have a mission trip that is happening today, and we will be addressing that in just a moment. Please be sure to follow the mission trip on the website through Pastor Howard's blog. Oh, it's, excuse me. Please feel free to follow the mission trip at this very specific address. <laughs> at this time, I would like to invite the mission team to come forward. The excited group is gathering. Friends, as we take part in this celebration of blessing and commissioning, we are reliving a practice of the early church. We read in the book of Acts that the Holy Spirit set apart Saul and Barnabas for the work of mission, and the church at Antioch, after fasting and praying, laid hands on them and sent them out. The early church eagerly sent its members to other peoples to assist those who were already of the household of faith and those who did not yet believe in Christ. Today we send our sisters and brothers to serve the needs of the church throughout the world. This commissioning and sending will strengthen the bonds we maintain with the faith-filled communities to which they are going, and the prayers we offer are an expression of the ties that bind us together in the larger bodies of Christ. I'd like to invite those in the congregation to stretch out your hands as we send forth. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross so that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you for the honor of your name. Amen. You may go forth. <laughs>
Good morning. Please stand as you're able and join me in the call to worship. Come, let's praise God together. Let's tell stories of God's power and majesty, God's mighty acts throughout history. Let's remember the compassion God has shown towards us, God's mercy and unfailing love, generation to generation. Let's pass these stories along to our children and grandchildren so that they too may come to know the love and love our God. For God is great and worthy of our praise. Let's worship together. seated. I invite you now to bow as we have a time of prayer. Though you are God, with all the influence and status that the name implies, you refuse to pull rank and parade your power among us. 
Instead, you chose to step down into our experience, living among us as one of us with all the struggle and suffering that goes with being human. More than that, you adopted the role of slave, washing feet, serving people of no reputation or social standing, and giving of yourself completely. As incredible as it sounds, you are the God who serves, and we can respond in no other way than to give ourselves to you in praise as we pray together the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture lesson today is from Exodus chapter 16, verses 2 through 7. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way I will, I will test them, whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? Hey everybody, I'm here. Christian here. Christian in the house. That's right. Just want you to know I uh, was voted second best Christian on my block. Just, just so you know. We're here. Yeah, I'm uh, coming up. There you go. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's going to be very lonely up here, but thank you. All right. Well, I'm here now. You're here. Guess that means we can get started. So, um, what'd you think of my entrance? It was great. Well, it, uh, you know, kind of uh, announced it like a king, right? Came in and made sure everybody knew that I was here and who I was, right? And, um, well, I mean, do you think that's a, a good way for Christians to kind of be known and entrance? Probably not. I'm so glad you answered that way. You being in college and all, I didn't know how educated you were going to be. <laughs> this was written for four-year-olds, so... Um, <laughs> Okay, so, so play along with me if you would, all right? Okay. So, I agree, you know, but what if we want people to know we're Christians? I mean, how, if we don't tell them, how do they know that we're Christians? The way we act, there you go, the series and sermon is over. All right. Well... In case you didn't know, Rachel, you might not have seen this, but the Apostle Paul wrote an epistle to the Philippians. Yeah, some of you might remember that. And uh, in that letter, he said that we as Christians should live as Christ lived, as Jesus lived. Well, how did Jesus live? Was he brash and, and loud? I mean, he was the Son of God, right? 
And I think we can agree that the Son of God is really higher even than kings here on earth, right? So surely there's some stories of God being very brash, perhaps bossing people around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, demanding more food at times, maybe, you know? Uh, I don't know, just, just acting like a king would act, perhaps. Um, but, you know, Jesus did really, his actions were just the opposite of that. Jesus lived differently than anyone else because what's important to people on earth, it was not important to Jesus at all. I don't think you're gonna find stories in the Bible about Jesus talking to his friends about that next big job that he was gonna get and if it had the right benefits or the house, if it was gonna be in the right school district, right? Um, you know, any of those earthly things, it just, it just, Jesus wasn't concerned about that. So why, if Jesus wasn't into those popular earthly things, why did people follow him? He was nice. Jesus loved people. Jesus loved everybody. And it's easy to be with people who love us, right? People who love us, they take care of us. They want us to be happy. They want us to feel safe. They want us to feel good about ourselves. They make us feel important. And that's the way that Jesus lived. He didn't demand that people take care of him. He took care of others. And that's the way that we're supposed to live. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us to announce that we're Christians. The Bible tells us to live like we're Christians. Say nice things to people. Let others go first. If you see someone who's being picked on, you know, go sit by that person and become their friend. When people see you being a Christian, that's way better than announcing and telling them that you are. All right, let's say a quick prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us an example of how we should live. And help us be aware this week of of how we can do that to share your love with others. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rachel. I'm reading a passage of scripture today from the book of Philippians, one of the most beautiful passages of scripture in the New Testament. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in, in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interest of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is God's word for us today. Please join in singing the next hymn, which is the Servant Song, number 2222, in the faith we sing, and we will be singing verses 1, 2, 5, and 6.
You may be seated. I am sharing a message today that has had several working titles. The title that I believe ended up, well, I don't really know what's ended up in the bulletin, but let me tell you what some of the working titles were. Um, one of the titles, or what it probably should have been, is Can Anyone Tell Who the Christians Are? Can Anyone Tell? But this sermon was based on a series that we had recently at our church called Love Never Ends. And during that sermon series, Love Never Ends, there was a question that kept nagging my mind. And the question was, what if unloving never ends? What if unloving never ends? This has been now a couple of years of really bad behavior. Public outbursts are on the rise. All you have to do is watch the news or look at social media and you see really tantrums happening in legitimate grown-ups. Tantrums are popular. Everyday circumstances can turn into a viral moment. Every time I get on a plane now, I make sure my phone is fully charged in case I need to record something to show to law enforcement officers. <laughs> Yesterday, when I was watching the news, I was reminded how sporting events have become really risky. Three news stories back to back talked about bad behavior at a baseball game, bad behavior at a basketball game, and bad behavior at a hockey game, not with the hockey players, but with the fans. We've also seen some really questionable be questionable behavior in the workplace, my workplace in included. I felt like it had become headquarters for bad behavior. However, I think this was pretty consistent with what is going on in our world today. At my own work, a small group of people who felt their way was not being heard resulted in part of the great resignation. We lost some really important people, and by the end of the school year, we had lost half of our staff. Are adult tantrums on the rise, and are we part of that? Well, it turns out that there is a name for people who are behaving badly. A few years ago, a word was ascribed to a very specific attitude and personality. Chances are you have seen reference to the word Karen. And by that, I mean Karen, in quotes. Karen is a derogative term for a woman who is perceived as entitled or demanding. And the term depicts those who use their privilege to demand their own way. Here's one definition. Karen is the archetype of a judgy, manager-seeking person whose existence feeds off of making retail employees wish they were dead. Now, labeling a particular type of person is somewhat revolutionary unless your name happens to be Karen. We have a very fine Karen in our church today, and she is a kind, loving, godly woman. And so if you're listening to this sermon online and your name is Karen, please do not take that personally. They have done studies that have reviewed websites where people have an opportunity to share their opinion, and they have found that Karen is not actually the number one complainer. I can say the name because I'm not really sure that we have this name in our church, but the person who complains most worldwide is actually named Louise. So I'm saying that to help all of the Karens feel a little bit better. Yes, you may applaud. Now, men, you are not off the hook because a man can also be called a Karen. My middle daughter is moving to a new home today, and she mentioned just in casual conversation, not knowing that I was talking about Karens today, she said, we already know that our next door neighbor is a man Karen. <laughs> and she explained how she had come to that decision. A former president was sometimes referred to as Karen in chief. So I think you get the idea. People actually study things like this. Kansas State University professor Heather Suzanne Woods, whose research interests include memes, said this about Karens. She said, the memes carry several stereotypes. The excessive use of Facebook, 
a particular bob haircut, sometimes called the can I speak to your manager haircut, and Karens are often the writer behind scathing reviews of establishments that don't meet expectations. Not to be left out, Christians have weighed in on the whole Karen thing and answered this compelling question. If there was a book of the Bible dedicated to the mindset of Karens, what would be included? The book of Karen, or Karenthians. <laughs> Blessed are the tantrum throwers, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Karen spoke unto the Lord and demanded to, demanded to see the manager. The Lord said unto Karen, I am the manager. And Karen went from that place humbled and thence penned a scathing one-star review of the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> one more. I could go on for quite some time. I'm, I'm limiting myself to one more, and that is, rude and uptight is the Karen. She guides the incorrect in what is right and teaches them her way or the highway. Some media outlets call 2020 the year of Karen, and it's carried over to present day. Why now? Is it the result of the pandemic? Is it fueled by social media? Is it just the current state of the world? Is it a means of survival or bringing order to chaos? Is it a new thing? Is it a sign that these are the end times? Well, all we have to do is open our Bible and go right back to the very beginning, and we realize that nothing is new under the sun, that it's not a recent phenomenon. We can go to the very first chapter of the Bible, or the very first section of the Bible, and look at Adam and Eve. They felt entitled to eat from the one tree that God told them not to eat from. There is an abundance of Karen-minded people in the Bible. There is another name that the Bible uses for Karens, entitled, miserable, off-putting people. The Bible calls them complainers, the biblical Karens. The biblical Karens that come to my mind are the ones that we read about in Scripture today, and those people would be the Israelites. The book of Exodus recounts God rescuing his people from bondage and from slavery. He promised to bring them into the promised land, the land of milk and honey. They had a relatively short journey through the wilderness to get to that land where God provided food and water for them every single day. And what was their response? The whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The people felt entitled to more than what God had already given them. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for complain is used 14 times, and 13 of those are used during the Exodus. The Israelites complained to Moses and Aaron about the lack of water, the lack of food, the leadership, and they even complained about the righteous judgment of God. Yes, they complained about God. It can be summarized in one word, they were entitled. The sad reality of the Karens happened to the Israelites. Ultimately, it's self-destructive to complain. Have you ever heard the expression, no one likes a complainer? I have a really softened version of that that I use at school for students. I tend to see the same students over and over and over, and I try to present it really positively. I talk to them about having more grit, how they can be just more tolerant, how they can distract themselves. But what I'm really trying to get across to them, I don't say in these words, no one likes a complainer, but that's actually the undercurrent, the theme. So Moses sent the spies into the promised land, and when they came back, what did they do? Well, they complained. And because of that, a journey that should have taken them one or two weeks at the most, just several weeks, turned out to be 40 years. Now, if we take an honest look at ourselves, we would realize that we all have it in us to be a Karen. 
While I was writing this sermon, I had an opportunity. I was at school one day and one of the teachers was eating a pizza from a pizza chain that I hadn't eaten at for a very long time. And I thought, oh, I'm going to stop on the way home from school and I'm going to get a pizza at this place. So I go to this chain pizza place and when I walked in, the manager was behind the cash register and I knew she was the manager because she was the only person that looked like an actual adult in the place. And while I was picking up my pizza, I noticed that right behind her was a young girl who had the most, the biggest, most awesome, wavy, long, strawberry blonde hair that she was brushing in the food prep area. Not only that, she was trying to pile all of her hair underneath a visor. And it didn't work the first time, so yes, she bent over, flipped her hair back, and put it up in the visor for a second time. As I was standing there in front of the manager, saying in my mind, God help me, and I mean that literally, don't be a Karen, don't be a Karen, don't be a Karen. So I went home with my pizza, and in my inbox pops a survey from said establishment. Would you ever eat at this restaurant again? Never. Would you recommend this restaurant to another person? Never. So I almost got through the whole thing by the power of God in me, but not quite so much. But that is an example of how easy it is to become a Karen when you really are trying hard not to. But here's the good news. We as Christians were born for such a time as this. In a world of eye-popping, terrible, bad behavior, we all have it in us not only to be kind and decent people, but to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Last week, we celebrated the confirmation of several of our young church members, and Pastor Howard reminded us, we are Christ's representatives in the world. Jesus said that he would not leave us alone, that he would send the Holy Spirit. These are the words of Jesus in the Gospel of John. He was speaking to the apostles. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can represent Christ well. The fruit of the Spirit is all these things, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The fact that we live in a culture right now that is the opposite of the Holy Spirit gives us an opportunity to stand out for being radically different. The opposite of the fruit of the Spirit includes these things. Hateful, miserable, discontent, impatient, unkind, bad, unfaithful, harsh, and out of control. We should feel incredibly grateful for the gift of the Holy Spirit. There's a museum in Washington, D.C. called the Museum of the Bible. I haven't visited it, maybe you have, but I would love to visit one day. My son-in-law visited and he was talking to me and showing me some pictures of a timeline that showed great Christians throughout the 20th century. And I'd like to show you a few. First of all, um, listed as one of the greatest Christians of the 20th century is, of course, Elvis. Um, I'm not sure that that's what Elvis was known for, but as you can see, Elvis had a Bible that is on display, and he did have a beautiful, beautiful album, maybe more than one album, I'm not sure, of hymns. So Elvis, and then next, I think these are both, both of these men were life-changing. They changed the world. The Reverend Billy Graham and Dr. and Reverend Martin Luther King. This is the 20th century. And it begs the question, who will represent the 21st century? Who? Who is a world changer? Who is living by the Spirit of God? Who is living like Jesus? So I tried to think of some people. I thought of Chance the Rapper, 
a Christian rapper. I thought of Kanye West. I would not have known who Kanye West was had I not had children that were young adults, but Kanye West, for all of the issues that he may have, um, he has come to faith and has his own church, and I'm not going to say any more about Kanye West, but will it be him? But for people of my generation, in the last couple of years, I've heard Kathy Lee Gifford interviewed on several morning talk shows and in various places about her faith, and let me tell you something, she is on fire for the Lord. She is preaching scripture. <laughs> So I'm not sure that any of those people will be changing the world. But what if the real game changers of the 21st century are you and me? By simply summoning up the power of the Holy Spirit within us and representing Christ. What we have as Christians is the one thing that we are not entitled to, and that is the grace of God. We don't deserve grace. We aren't entitled to grace. In fact, sin actually disqualifies us from grace. Yet God in his infinite love for us gives us an opportunity to accept the gift of his Savior so that we can not only have eternal life, but we can have life here and now, life abundant. Jesus gave us our example. He made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, and he humbled himself to become obedient to death, even death on the cross. He gave up what he was entitled to so that he could give us grace, eternal life, and not only that, the Holy Spirit. So it seems like we could give up being unloving. I work at a school that is named for the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit Catholic School. And I'd like to close by praying a prayer that we pray every day at school. And for many years, I just kind of prayed, um, prayed the words and didn't really think much about it until this really difficult year where I've not only listened to the words, but I've prayed the words even on days that aren't school days. This is the prayer of St. Augustine, the prayer of the Holy Spirit. Breathe in me, O Holy Spirit, that my thoughts may all be holy. Act in me, O Holy Spirit, that my work too may be holy. Draw my heart, O Holy Spirit, that I would love but what is holy. Strengthen me, O Holy Spirit, to defend all that is holy. And guard me then, O Holy Spirit, that I always may be holy. Amen. At this time, I would like to invite the ushers to come forward to receive the offering.
Father, we are your servants. In you we live and move and have our being. We offer you our thanksgiving and call on your name. We love you, Lord, for you hear us and respond in graciousness and compassion and righteousness. Now receive our tithes and offerings, we pray. Multiply them so that your work and word can go forth. Amen. Please join in the closing hymn, They Can Tell We Are Christians By Our Love. forth today, please receive this benediction. Today, we remember that the Holy Spirit empowers us to represent Christ, to be his witnesses in our homes, our community, and our world. Amen. <laughs>